We all set? Good afternoon. My name is Jim Boyle from uh, the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Tuesday afternoon discussion with our invited guest speaker, Josh Koppelman. Um, a few words about YAI and the summer program before we get started. Uh, we're about six or is it seven weeks in? We're seven weeks into the 10 week summer fellowship where the best of the ventures from the Yale community are being accelerated. We have in the audience today a number of fellows, as well as a number of people from uh, the Venture Creation Program. That's a sister program for helping earlier ventures get their, foot, their feet on the ground. And last, we have a number of the people from the Tech Bootcamp here who are being trained in the full web stack with the hopes that they become expert programmers and start their own ventures, or at least become useful to the teams who, who need developers and programmers in their midst. So thank you all for being here today. Um, a few words about Josh. I first met Josh in uh, 2008 when he came in in the second year of the Summer Fellowship. And um, he did a great job in, in talking about his own venture experience and things to things that um, entrepreneurs should look for when they're, when they're creating uh, their ventures. I think Josh's background is actually, I hope, a little atypical of, of, of most um, uh, venture investors because it seems to be um, filled with nothing but success. So uh, bear with me while I, I share a little bit about Josh's uh, history. Uh, as, as an active entrepreneur and investor in the internet industry, um, he was first a student at the Wharton School at UPenn where he co-founded Inf the Infonautics Corporation and took it public on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange in 1996. I hate you already, Josh. Uh, <laughs> Josh fa also founded Half.com in July of 1999 and let it become one of the largest sellers of used books, movies, and music in the world. Half.com was acquired by eBay in July of 2000. And Josh remained with eBay for three years, running that business unit and growing eBay's media marketplace to almost half a billion dollars in annual gross merchandise sales. In late 2003, Josh helped to found Turntide, an anti-spam company that created the world's first anti-spam router. Turntide was acquired by Symantec just six months later. Um, these results are not typical. I hope you all don't go out there thinking this is going to happen to you, but that's what he did. <laughs> Josh founded First Round Capital in uh, where he is now in 2004 to reinvent seed stage investing. Uh, since that time, the firm has invested in over 200 emerging technology startups, uh, becoming one of the most active venture capital firms in the country. Uh, Josh himself has been ranked 12th on Forbes' uh, 2013 list of Midas list top 100 tech investors. He's been named as one of the top 10 angel investors in the US by Newsweek magazine, uh, one of uh, tech's new kingmakers by Business 2.0 magazine, and also labeled as a rising VC star by Fortune magazine. Josh also is the proud winner of a second place ribbon in the 2011 Nantucket Watermelon Eating Competition. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. Josh is an investor <laughs> on 13 US patents for his work in internet technology. And in June of 2000, he was awarded um, Ernst & Young's uh, pre prestigious Entrepreneur of the Year Award uh, for the greater Philadelphia region. Uh, Josh earned a, a Bachelor of Science degree cum laude in Entrepreneurial Management and Marketing from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, that's a very impressive background, and I'm sure he has impressive things to share. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Josh. Thank you. Thanks. So um, what I figured I'd do today is share some of the lessons I've learned, I guess, in, you know, both I've, I've now um, been a VC for almost 10 years. Before that, um, you know, I, so it was back 10 years ago where I traded my green lightsaber in for the red lightsaber and sort of became a VC. So I figure I'll talk about some of my experience as an entrepreneur, some of my experiences in terms of um, what I've had the opportunity to learn as a VC. Um, and then I'm going to try to get to questions fairly quickly because I find that that's often um, the most interesting conversation and that's often the most interesting dialogue. Um, you know, that's a cool ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that, that's my favorite part of my job is that we as a firm now see about 3,000 opportunities a year. So in my brief 10-year stint as a seed stage investor, we've had the opportunity to see 30,000 roughly um, startup opportunities. And they're all different. 
there's only one thing that they all have in common. You know, you go back and look at all 30,000 of the business plans or pitches, there's one thing that they have in common, uh, and that is that they're all wrong. Um, the m moment you hit send, save, print on a business plan, it's out of date because a business plan is a projection. It's a prediction of the future. It's going to be, this is what's going to happen over the next three to five years in terms of you know, our milestones, competition, pricing, sales, revenue. Um, so the, the, the first thing that I, I kind of have learned as a VC is that the business plan isn't the most important thing. Um, the most important thing is the founder. Um, we really don't judge the companies that we invest in based on how good the founder's crystal ball is, based on how good that founder is at predicting the future. Instead, what we're really trying to assess is how do those founders adapt to change? Because the minute you hit save on that business plan, things happen. A competitor comes in, Google announces product X, your CTO quits, it takes you six times as long to build something. All of that change is unpredictable. And, and so what we're trying to judge as a seed stage investor is how does that founder deal with change? Um, and that's pretty much our job. It's trying to sort of assess founders. What we, what we say we look for in founders are heat-seeking missiles. And, and there's a difference between sort of heat-seeking missiles and traditional missiles. If you were looking at a missile 30 plus years ago, you programmed in the destination on the launch pad because these missiles were expensive and hard to program. And you hit, you know, when you want to send it, you hit like the red button, it takes off and it either hits the target or it doesn't. And that was kind of like building a software company 20 years ago. Um, today, it's very different. Today, what we're looking for are entrepreneurs who are constantly scanning the horizon, picking up signal. That could be signal from investors, signal from advisors, signal from customers, signal, signal from competitors, and trying to figure out what's signal and what's noise, and are adjusting course all along the way. It's a very iterative process. And the best entrepreneurs, the ones who, who who have correlated, you know, where their, where their outcomes have correlated the strongest in our, in, our, in our investments to success are those entrepreneurs who are heat-seeking missiles. It's th those entrepreneurs who have the ability to sort of constantly scan the horizon, figure out what signal is, 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 is strong and what's noise, and when to adjust course. Um, and how many people in here have read The Lean Startup? Okay, so I guess it's required reading to get in the door. Um, <laughs> You know, but that's a lot of what we do because we're a seed stage investor and we think seed stage investing is very different than venture investing. Venture investing is about taking a business and scaling it, adding fuel to the fire. Uh, seed stage investing is about doing one of three things. You want to take an entrepreneur's hypothesis and do one of three things to it. You want to validate it, you want to de-risk it, or disprove it. And you want to do that as quickly and as capital efficiently or as cheaply as possible. And that's, that's what our job is. Um, so we, we really subscribe to the lean startup methodology and, and we look for founders that do. Um, a lot of what we fund are experiments. What we're funding are things that are intended to get data. Because when you build your original business model and you have this like spreadsheet of unknown variables, like everyone's gonna have a spreadsheet which has like 20 unknowns. If you're building a consumer company, you don't know what your customer acquisition cost is, what your conversion rate is, what your lifetime value of a customer is. If you're selling ads, you don't know what your click-through rate is, your sell-through rate is, your monetization rate. If you're an enterprise company, you don't know what your lead time is, what your conversion rate is, what your ARR, annual recurring revenue is. You don't know any of that stuff. So when you start off, you have this like beautiful Excel model, which is going to be wrong, but has like lots of unknown assumptions. And, and, and what we've seen, like the goal of starting up a company is, is, the, is trying to figure out how to turn those assumptions into real numbers and what order to do that in. Because you start off and you have 20 unknowns, but all of those unknowns aren't equal. There are some unknowns which, which create massive enterprise risk if, or create massive enterprise value if you're able to sort of figure that out. And that's a lot of what we do as seed investors. So let me give an example of that. One of the companies we funded maybe seven or eight years ago, is a company called Tech Forward. And here's what they figured out. What they figured out was that if you looked at big box uh, hardware retailers, like the Best Buys of the world, the, the, the Circuit Cities when they were around and those type of folks, um, 20 to 30 percent of their bottom line income, their profit was sold, is, was one product, extended warranties. You'd walk in and they'd say, would you like to buy an extended warranty on that? 
and everyone would buy it, and it was 30 bucks, and you know, not everyone, but like around 3% of the people would buy it, 30 bucks, and it's pure profit, because it's just, it, it, you know, they never actually call. Um, and what ended up happening is that they saw that fewer and fewer people were buying it, though, starting around 2007, 2008, because people kind of shifted from owning products from extended periods of time to owning products from short period of time. Right? Instead of owning a laptop for a long period of time, you have a laptop for three years, then you upgrade. Instead of owning a, my parents owned a camera for 15 years, and now you own a camera for two years, it's a phone. And, and so, so what they found was that this, this line of business was disappearing for these big box retailers. So they came up with a concept. They also realized that less than 4% of people actually sell their item when they upgrade on eBay or Craigslist. And a lot of them just sit in drawers or closets or shelves. So they came up with a program that what if these big box retailers, instead of selling um, an extended warranty sold a guaranteed buyback, where you'd walk in, they'd say, you want to sell that laptop back or that iPad back or that camera back? Great. Pay us 30 bucks now, and any time in, in the next two years, we guarantee to give you 30% of your money back. So, right, you give us 30 bucks now, we'll give you 200 bucks any time in the next few years. You know, for a lot of people, that wasn't a decision, that's an IQ test. Just, you know, I give you 30, you give me 200 whenever I want. Um, and when we saw that, there were just so many unknowns in that company. And you, you know, how many people would, would do it? Would you be able to sell the used goods? All of that stuff. We said, yeah, as we began to sort of work with that entrepreneur, it became clear that in our perspective, there were two or three unknowns. The first unknown is, would a consumer buy it? And the second unknown um, is, how price sensitive are they on the buyback? And, and we gave, so we gave the company $300,000 to get those two answers in the Excel model. That's it. We gave them $300,000 for two cells in an Excel spreadsheet. You know what they did? They were in LA at the time. So they went to seven computer stores and said, for the next four months, we'd like you to sell these guaranteed buybacks. And you could keep all the profit, 100%. The only thing we ask every day is, how many laptops did you sell? And how many guaranteed buybacks did you sell? Because we want to know the attach rate. And we want you to do this for a few months. And in the first month, we're going to do it at a 20% discount to the price. And the second month, we're going to do it at a 30% discount to the retail price. The fourth month, we'll do it at 40% and so on. And uh, third month, we'll do it at 30% and so 40% and so on. And what they found during this process was that around 7 to 8% of the people who were asked actually bought it. And as long as they were getting about 3x their buyback price, so if they were paying 30 bucks, as long as they were getting close to 100 bucks in the buyback, they were price insensitive. And now all of a sudden we had answers to those two cells. We instantly stopped selling through those seven or nine you know, used computer stores because it was just an experiment. Um, company took that data, went out to raise venture, and they raised a large round from NEA um, at a much higher price. Why? Because those two cells in the spreadsheet represented massive enterprise risk. Right? If it, 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 there was so much unknown before. Will the consumers buy it? And are they price sensitive? Well, now you kind of knew. You had that data. Um, and they went on to launch it, you know, they, they did it with Radio Shack, they did it with Dell, they did it with Amazon. Um, you know, I'll tell you this, the end of the story later. It wasn't a particularly great ending, but it was a good beginning story. Um, because it teaches you about the, the importance of understanding, you know, building experiments to, 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 to try to figure out what is the key risk. Now, those experiments didn't solve the risk of would a Radio Shack or a Dell or an Amazon buy it. We just figured that if we could show demonstrably, prove, you know, meaningfully higher sell-through rate than a, than a guaranteed buyback would, that, that was the risk. That was a risk we would be willing to take, and we thought downstream VCs would be willing to take. And so, from our perspective, that's a meaningful portion of what we what we view the startup process as. Because I think there's a big difference between a startup and a company. Um, you know, I, I think a startup is 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 a business which is trying to get answers and a company which is a, is a business which is trying to get scale. Um, and, and so we're in the business of funding startups today. Um, you know, and we've seen a fair number of companies come through our doors that we made the wrong decision on. So I'm probably one of the few speakers that will ever come in here that offered their first term sheet to Twitter. I did. They, they turned it down. They, they did then come back when they raised a second term sheet and gave us a second chance to humiliate, oursel humiliate ourselves and said, hey, okay, now that you've, you know, we know we turned down the first term sheet, but we're going to, you know, raise around at a 4x higher price. Do you want to come in? At which point we said, no, $20 million was too high a price for Twitter. Um, you know, um, you know 
live and learn. The good news about that was it got us to let us, it introduced us to Jack Dorsey. So when Jack was starting Square, um, and he came, uh, he came back and said, you've got to give me a chance to redeem myself. you just got to. And uh, he said, well, if you thought $20 million is expensive, our seed round is going to be $40 million. We said, fine. But we learned. We said, sure. Um, <laughs> and we're thankful that we were uh, you know, one of the second largest investors. We were the second largest investor in Square Seed Round. So, um, you know, but, but a lot of what we do as a seed stage investor is about trying to sort of work with entrepreneurs during this process to figure out what the key risks are. And as you guys are going through your process right now, I would really encourage you to look at your models, to look at your list of assumptions, to look at your unknowns and list them out, and then rank them. Um, like if you're building, a, I'll just pick a business which no one's probably building, but if you're building an ad-supported sort of you know, media property, well, you know, one of the unknowns might be the click-through rate or the, the CPM that you're going to sell ads at. Yeah, that, that, those are unknowns, but Fortunately, there's so many other companies that have that type of that have that type of model that you know what you could at least put bands on that. An investor would be able to put bands on that and say the click-through rate will probably be between X and Y, and the and, and your CPM would be between A and B. And that probably I, I'd be very surprised if that pop if those unknowns pop up towards the top of your list in terms of the most urgent and ones to execute against. And so so I'd encourage you to all build that list, and then figure out what are the experiments that you can do to try to, to get answers to those, those unknowns. And I mean, and there's some really clever, I mean, if you, if you read Hacker News, if you read, um, there's just so many clever ways to sort of ghetto test things these days, right? Like, it used to be that you had to, in order to do something, you had to build it. And today, you want to understand demand? Great. How many people are searching for it on Google? Take 100 bucks on a credit card, you'll be able to find that out. You'll know how many searches a day you get. OK, will your messaging and positioning hit? OK. Put up an ad and see how, what percent of them click on it. You know, you, is, should we be going with product offering A or product offering B? Put up a two-page dummy website and measure the convert after they click on it and measure the conversion rate. Like, there's so many ways that you could you could generate data, and and when you're fundraising, every unknown that you know, if you could take some of those key those key high unknowns, and shift them to knowns, that's called de-risking your business. And, and valuation is really a representation of two things. Like the valuation of your company, what your stock is worth, is a representation of two things. It's a representation of the size of the market you're going after, how big can this be, and the amount of risk that remains between here and success. So you're going after a big market, great. A lot of risk, the valuation comes down. So, the more you could de-risk it, the more you could eliminate your, the big risks, the more you're increasing value. So that's, a, that's sort of like a large part of the framework that, that, that we're pursuing. You know, over time, though, there are some con, you know, c contrary lessons that I've learned. Um, you know, the first is that um, when I was at Wharton, there was a professor that told me that successful entrepreneurs are ones who could identify a new market risk uh, sorry, new market opportunity, and solve it. And it's taken me now over 20 years, but I've kind of gotten the confidence to say I respectfully disagree. Um, it's very rare to find a new market opportunity. If someone was walking down the street and found a block that was completely undeveloped, they could like there's no real estate and no buildings on that block, like right here in the middle of New Haven. Like they could have one of two conclusions. Like one conclusion is. I'm the first person in the world to discover this block. <laughs> I'm going to be rich. Or they could kind of figure out like, hey, you know, there might, this might have been, might be a toxic waste dump here. Someone might have tried to build it. Someone else might have tried to, you know, like, like and, and I think the same thing happens you know, out in the industry so often that um, it's very rare to sort of be one, someone that uncovers something new. I, it's amazing, now having been in this industry for so long, how many entrepreneurs come in and haven't done the work to try to figure out what are the lessons I can learn from the people that tried this before? Because chances are someone tried it before. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't, but it does mean that you should at least get the benefit. You know, if, they, if they wasted five, 10, 20 million dollars of venture money trying to build it and they've failed, you at least want to get the benefit of, like, they've paid the tuition, you should at least get the education as to, as to why, this is, you know, why that didn't work. Um, and, 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 and again, I'm not saying that because something failed before, it'll fail now. That's not the lesson. You know, there are plenty of companies that 
um, couldn't have, that, that exists now that couldn't have existed before. We were the seed investor in, a, in, in Uber. I see they're actually, UberX is here now. So, so, and they, they, they spent the first four to six months after we funded them in our office. And that business could not have existed, could not have existed without a mobile phone. Like no one's gonna be walking down the street, taking out the backpack, opening up their laptop, booting it up, waiting for two minutes for the laptop to boot up, hoping they could pick up Wi-Fi or 3G and then typing in their location and calling a car. Like that just doesn't exist. Um, so you know, once the mobile phone came out, it sort of opened up a whole new set of opportunities. And as the mobile phones add more sensors and more things onto it, you're gonna have more opportunities to sort of build those things. But you wanna at least learn the lessons from people uh, in the past. And I'd also argue that you know, Uber was not a new behavior. It's, you know, all, instead of creating a new market, it took an existing market and made it faster, easier, cheaper, reduced friction. And that's oftentimes what we see a lot of successful entrepreneurs are doing. They're not, they're not necessarily creating a new demand. They're not creating a new budget line item that, that, that people hadn't spent any money on before. But instead, they're taking a budget line item that someone had spent money on before and trying to do it faster, better, cheaper, uh, and easier. So that, that was actually the, the, the value proposition for, for my second company, a company called Half.com. Half.com was a person-to-person -person marketplace which allowed people to buy and sell books, music, movies, and video games online and quickly grew to be one of the largest online. And you know, the value pro I'll ask this question. How many people have read a book by um, John Grisham, Stephen King, Danielle Steele, James Patterson? Uh, raise your hand if you've read that book, read a book by them. All right, keep the hands up. How many have read that book twice? That's my entire business model. Like, that was it. Like, that was the business model in one question, which is that the average household spent over, you know, had over $1,000 worth of value on their bookshelf that they would never read again. Yeah, you know, you know and, and, you know, same thing with movies, same thing with, with music. And we created a marketplace to allow people to monetize that. We weren't creating a new demand. We weren't creating a new behavior. In fact, when we started this in 1999, um, the single most hot area in technology was the internet. The single most hot area in internet was e-commerce, it was consumer. The single most hot area in consumer was e-commerce. The, the single largest spend area in e-commerce was books with Amazon. So if you followed conventional wisdom, you'd say, don't go there. That's like, that's the one area not to go to. And instead we said, we're going to go there, just do it faster, better, quicker, easier, cheaper. Um, and, and because people were spending money there, we didn't have to deal with the number one risk of any consumer company, which is customer acceptance risk. Because we knew that customers were already buying this stuff online. It's just a question of, of, of trying to find a way to transfer sort of, uh, you know, state from one market to another. Um, you know, another, another sort of thing I learned in my career um, is that you could be successful not just by growing markets, but by shrinking markets. So my first company was a company called Infonautics, and we built a service called Homework Helper. And Homework Helper was available on CompuServe before the web, and Prodigy before the web, and then AOL. We powered the Homework Helper on AOL. And, um, and um, so we were in like the educational information space. And at the same time we were around, we saw um, the complete destruction of a market, uh, the encyclopedia market. When we started Infonautics in 1991, the encyclopedia market was a $1.2 billion market. It was dominated by uh, Brit uh, Encyclopedia Britannica and World Book. And your, the average encyclopedia sold for $1,500. And, and around 94, 95, Microsoft said, you know, we want to be in that market. So they went out and they licensed the worst encyclopedia in the world, F Fug uh, Funk and Wagnall's encyclopedia. It was re re reportedly to be the worst. Like, but, you know, um, and they spent $10 million to license it. And they put it on CD-ROMs, and they distributed it with every, every computer sold in a two or three year period of time. So you're talking about you know, going from you know, a few hundred thousand encyclopedias sold to 40 million encyclopedias sold. Now, Microsoft only made like 50 cents a copy. Like they got 50 cents from the OEM for putting this disc in. But they sold 40 million, so they made $20 million a year. Um, but what, what's fascinating is what happened. Um, Microsoft made money on this thing, and it also, you know, also accomplished their other goal of helping to sell computers because it created sort of an ed another educational use. So it was very profitable for Microsoft. Microsoft would say it's a great business. However, 
the encyclopedia market plummeted at that time to about $600 million. So Microsoft made around 20 to 30 million and took away 600 million from their competitors. Uh, very asymmetric competition, right? So for every dollar that Microsoft made, they maybe took 20 or 30 from the entrenched players. Like, how do you compete with that? Um, that's called shrinking a market. They shrunk a market in terms of dollars. They shifted the market share to them. Um, you know, now, what's fascinating is Microsoft itself got shrunk by Wikipedia, which happened later on, right? Now, I mean, like, you know, and now, you know, the encyclopedia industry is a fraction of what it used to be. Um, you know, when I was growing up, every house, you know, you know every child had an, had an encyclopedia in their house, and today, few do. Um, so what it, what it talks about is the importance of shrinking, like how you could actually make money by shrinking the overall, you know, increasing unit sales, but maybe shrinking revenue or shrinking your, your retail price. We kind of saw the same thing at half.com. We sold books, used books, and one of the most popular e feature email campaigns that Half ever did was we saw that when, when someone bought a fiction book, the, the research said they would typically read it within two weeks of purchase. So about two and a half or three weeks after purchase, we would send out a simple email. Say you bought a Harry Potter book, or say you bought a John Grisham book, and you bought it for 15 bucks. It was, you know, knew it would be 30, but you bought it on half.com for 15. We'd send you an email three weeks later saying, you want your $15 back. Click here to relist John Grisham, that, that book. And surpri you know, surprisingly, like lots of people clicked because they finished the book. It was on the shelf. It was one click, and they kind of will sell it and get their money back. And what we saw is for some books like Harry Potter, we were turning that same book on average four times. Because <laughs> someone would buy it, read it, then sell it and get their money back. And so think about like the two, the two ways that that book could have been sold. $30 new, if four people had bought that book new, that would be $120 that would have sort of value capture that would have occurred, right? It probably would have gone to Borders or the, the publisher or the author, but $120. In our model, we had someone buy it for $15, sell it, and we would take about a $3 commission. So in our model, we made $12. And, this, you know, and, this, and the, the person who bought it would, you know, be out, each person would be out three bucks. So when you think about it, in our model, like we took $12 out of the ecosystem for that same four book transfer, whereas buying it new would have taken 120. So, you know, again, you know, a very asymmetric way to compete in, in that, you know, for every dollar of revenue that half.com made, we took $10 away from our competitors. And it's not, you know, I was looking back at the business plan the other day, and when, in our competition section, we listed four you know, team of, like huge competitors. Uh, Tower Records, Blockbuster Video, uh, Borders. It's just crazy when you think about sort of how like the industry has changed in just 15 years. But those were all multi-billion dollar companies whose industry got redefined and shrunk. But again, not trying to create a, create a new need, just trying to figure out a faster, better, cheaper way to sort of solve an existing need. Um, you know, I get, and I guess one of the questions I get asked a lot, I'll talk about for a little bit, which is how do you deal with competitive risk? How do you deal with the fact that you're a startup and Google could come out and crush you or Facebook could come out and crush you? And I'll give an example, again, of, asymmetric, uh, of asymmetries where someone's strength could actually be their weakness. Um, so I was at eBay, because eBay acquired Half.com, um, before they bought PayPal. And eBay had an internal product called uh, Billpoint, which was their payment service. It was their, their attempt to compete with PayPal. I don't, I don't know if anyone remembers it. It was about in 2002. So, um, yeah, Billpoint was there. And it, what's interesting is it was a joint venture between them and Wells Fargo Bank. So it was like one of the largest e-commerce sites in the world and the largest, like, one of the largest banks in the country. Um, you know, competing against a startup called PayPal. So why did PayPal win um, and eBay lose? Because eBay ultimately lost and had to go buy PayPal. So what, why is that? And I'd say the answer is sort of three things. Um, the first is that everyone universally acknowledged that PayPal had a better product. Uh, eBay's product was clunky and you had to go through all of these hurdles to use it. Um, and I was there at eBay and I saw these product planning sessions and 
what I came to realize was, you know, PayPal was solving for one thing, happy customers, minimizing friction, building a beautiful product that would delight the customers. In eBay's business, um, in product planning meetings, there were almost as many lawyers as there were product managers. And the reason why is because, well, let's step back. If you look at PayPal's S1, which is the, the document they file when they go public, and turn to the risk factor section, which everyone has, it's amazing to look at some of these risk factors. At the time of their IPO, PayPal was under investigation by the attorney generals of over 20 states for potential violation of banking laws. They were in violation of the MasterCard, American Express, and Discover merchant processing agreements. Um, they were under investigation for uh, providing payment, illegal payment services for gambling and for pornography. And there was also a federal investigation as well. And this was all there when they went public. Um, but why? Why is it? And the reason why is because the laws in all of those states, were, you know, some of the banking laws were last updated in the 1930s and never contemplated any of these, these, these systems. So PayPal built a product, again, not trying to sort of aim for the, like, you know, aim for sort of we're going to do something illegal, but A, building a great product that people wanted. And there's a lot of gray area in the law because like, like something was never anticipated. We see that now with Uber, right? There's a lot of gray area with what's going on there now because they're doing something that was never anticipated. What's a dispatch service? Well, previously, if it was defined by having to call on the phone, is a dispatch service pushing a button on the phone? Unknown. So, so what ended up happening, though, is if you're eBay, valued at over $20 billion, and you're Wells Fargo, valued at over $100 billion, you can't afford to take any risks. If you're, if you're the, the largest bank in the country, you can't afford your market cap. There's no way you could take any risks with that, whereas PayPal could. PayPal could say, we're going to optimize around what's the right experience for the customer in the market, and we're going to trust that as the laws catch up with technology, they will get changed. So the first thing I'd say that, that, that really benefited is even though PayPal even though it was, was tiny compared to you know, both eBay and, and Wells Fargo, when you look at that example, um, Wells Fargo and eBay's greatest asset, which might have been their balance sheet and their value and their worth and all of their employees, was actually their biggest liability, which is they had to build a product that was 100% compliant with every law in every state um, and could not deal with any ambiguity, could not deal with any gray, so, uh, any, any gray which is why the product was better. Second, second reason why I think eBay won. Uh, PayPal won. Um, when you look at pay, how did PayPal acquire customers, at the time, eBay had over $2 billion of cash in the bank. So they had a lot of cash. PayPal had raised less than $100 million. So you know, eBay clearly should have been able to outspend them. But they weren't. And they couldn't because they were a public company. At the time, eBay's total net income, their profit line, was under $100 million. So one of the things PayPal did with their $100 million in the bank is they launched this program. For every, every time you send money to someone and they create an account, we'll give them $5 and we'll give you $5. So e uh, PayPal basically spent $10 to acquire a customer, five for the sender, five for the recipient. In the course of 18 months, they gave away $40 million from venture capitalists to consumers that way. They got 4 million customers. It was a great wealth transfer from VCs to consumers, right? You know, and, and, and a lot of people took it up. But their view was, we're going to spend $40 million to get 4 million customers. And the, the, the enterprise value of those customers is going to be worth far more than $40 million. And they were right. So you'd ask, well, why couldn't eBay do the same? eBay had $2 billion worth of, of, of cash in the bank. eBay could easily outspend PayPal. eBay could say, we'll give you 10 and give them 10 and double it. But they couldn't because they were a public company. And at the, at the time, they had about 80 million of net income, of profit in the bottom, you know, on the bottom line. So their earnings per share was like were based on $80 million of profit. If eBay had spent $40 million, their profit would have cut in half. So like, and, and how do public companies get evaluated? They get evaluated based on earnings per share profit. Um, and the PE ratio, price to, you know, price to earnings ratio. So what ended up happening is the fact that eBay was a public company meant again that there were asymmetric risk profiles, right? That, that PayPal could take far greater risk than eBay could. PayPal was willing to spend 40% you know, of the cash that they had in the bank, half the, you know, almost half their money, to do something where 
eBay couldn't spend 4% of their cash or 2% of their cash to do the same because of the profit. So like the reason I bring this up is what appears to be larger companies' strengths can oftentimes be their weaknesses. And as you're building businesses, I think it's really important to think through who your competitive sets are, uh, who your competitors are, competitors are, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and, and try to figure out how can you set up a situation so that you could actually exploit that. Um, you know, I don't know. Lots of other things we could talk about, but why don't I start by asking if there are any questions out there? Yes? If you had to advise a larger corporation, such as your example with uh, eBay, would you say to them, listen, it's a great idea. Why don't you fund a startup? Or how would you differentiate the two so that it didn't burn into this problem? Yeah, so yeah, so I, I mean, I think that it, it, you, you've seen companies go out of different ways. You've seen some companies, you know, incubate startups and spin them out. You've seen some companies fund them. You've seen other companies acquire startups but let them run autonomously, right? So, um, you know, eBay acquired StubHub but let it run autonomously. So that's an example where they sort of got a startup in and got that startup's DNA, but they didn't integrate the companies at all. And it was, you know, the, even though they could have. They just let those two companies grow separately. Can you tell us also, when we're looking at our risk assessments that you were talking about, what's the best methodology to get someone to review it from a different perspective so that you don't... So like when you're making your list of the unknowns and you're trying to figure out which ones? I mean, that's what, that's what VCs are really good at, I believe. Like if you're going to be meeting with VCs early on or you have the opportunity to meet with investors early on, the thing I would be asking them is not to fund your company now because you're probably too early, but instead I would be sort of showing them the model and saying like which of these 15 unknowns, if these variables in spreadsheets, like which ones are the most important for me to go out and prove over the next six to nine months? Um, and that's what we do as investors, right? We make these seed investments. We've now invested in over 250 companies and our average initial investment, you know, while large by startup size, is still small by venture size. Our average initial investment is half a million dollars. So it's not a large check for, for technology companies. Um, and and you know, so we've invested maybe $100 million of initial capital uh, in these companies. And to date, that's been followed on by almost $6 billion cap dollars of capital behind us. You know, so we're, you're looking at almost a 60 to 1 ratio of every dollar we put into a company, you know, $60 comes in later. And the reason that happens, we think, is because um, you know, we work with our companies to help them try to figure out what are the things you need to achieve with this financing that will dramatically sort of get you to an inflection point on risk. We'll, we'll, we'll help you validate some hypotheses, disprove others, uh, and de-risk them. So, so I think that's like, if you're asking who the best person to talk to is, I would say someone, an investor, a venture capitalist, someone who's, who, who can look at it dispassionately and say, like, this is what I need to, to, to invest in. And I think that fundraising often isn't a process. It isn't like, a, OK, I'm going to fundraise in the fall. Some of the best fundraising processes happen over the course of building a relationship with investors over a period of time, right? You start out and say, I know it's, I know it's way too early, but I want to sort of show you where we are, get some input on where we need to go, and maybe I'll check in with you a few times over the course of the next year to kind of show you the milestones we're hitting. And then when you actually hit them, 12 or 18 months later, you're, 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 it's a much, much stronger, you're in a much stronger position. Because um, VCs sort of deal with lines, not dots. Mark Schuster is a VC, he sort of wrote a whole blog post about that, right? Which is that, like, if I come in and I see you right now and you tell me your cost of customer acquisition is X or your revenues are Y, like, that's a dot on the board. Um, and that's useful and valuable. But, what, you know, but the most valuable thing is if I see this dot, and then I come back and talk to you two months later, and there's like that dot. And then there's, you know, two, three months later, there's that dot. And then what, what are VCs good at? They're good at connecting the dots and sort of, you know, you give me three data points and I can extrapolate to infinity. And, and you know, and, and, and sort of that's the ideal, at least what we've seen, that's kind of one of the most powerful ways to fundraise. Yes? Um, I'm interested in the fact that there are so few women in both venture capital as partners and as CEOs of uh, VC-backed companies, and I'm wondering why you think those two things are both, both women in, in VC firms and entrepreneurs themselves. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I would say you know we funded now about 20 
women, uh, CEO, women started companies. You're actually going to be meeting with one in two weeks. Susan Koger from ModCloth. We were the seed investor in ModCloth. Um, and you know, I think historically a lot of it has been sort of where do these com where, where do tech companies come from? Some of it comes some of it comes down to just engineering. You know, a lot historically a lot of the tech companies have been very tech and software based. And if you look at the attendance at sort of engineering schools, that you know, you 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 open up, you know, oftentimes you look at hackathons and you just see more men than women at hackathons. We're seeing some of that change though. Uh, especially as companies have, as, as technology companies have moved moved towards content, towards commerce, and and less raw tech, um, you're seeing a lot of that change, which we think is a really strong sign. And we we started this initiative uh, two years ago at, at first round. We call it the dorm room fund. Um, and what the dorm room fund is is uh, we kind of said, well, if you look at some of the greatest startups in the tech space ever, they were started in dorm rooms. Bill Gates started in a dorm room. Mark Zuckerberg started in a dorm room. Yahoo, in a dorm room. Dell, in a dorm room. Like, you know, like these, these are, these are ma massive companies that got started in dorm rooms. Um, so, and, and as the cost to start companies has come way down, which it has, right? Like today, you know, 2006 to build a mobile app cost over $2 million. Today to be an Apple authorized developer is under $200. You could be in the app store in two weeks. It's like, it's transformational. So as the cost has come down and, and entrepreneurship has gotten more democratized, um, what hasn't changed is how do entrepreneurs in college that want to stay in college still have access to capital, right? If you want to drop out of school, you could apply to a lot of accelerators like a Y Combinator or a Dreamit or a Techstars or one of those, but they typically require you to move there and leave school. I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm just saying that, that you know, there's a, there is a group of entrepreneurs that aren't looking to do that. Um, VC firms such as even First Round who write small checks compared to most VCs of $500,000, we're not going to write a $20,000 check in a college sophomore and wait two years for them to graduate. So we're, how do college entrepreneurs raise money today? It's pretty much the same way they did 10 years ago, friends and family, which is surprising because even though the cost has come way down and technology has transformed and entrepreneurship has been democratized, access to capital hasn't. Um, so we said, what if we could create a program that funds entrepreneurs while they're in college. But who should run it? Because like we have day jobs and we, we don't know these entrepreneurs in college. So we said, well, if entrepreneurs are smart enough to be creating these great companies while they're in college, why aren't they smart enough to identify them and pick them? So we did an experiment two years, in Philadelphia, two years ago in Philadelphia. We said, we want students to apply to be the partners of the Dorm Room Fund Philadelphia. And we'd give them half a million dollars to invest in 25 companies, 20,000 a pop. And I posted a blog post. 700 people expressed interest um, to be one of the, the 10 partners for the dorm room fund. And we did it. And we picked 10 partners, the students, they, and they picked the, their successors. So it's completely hands off by us. Um, and to date, the Penn dorm room fund has, has, has committed capital to over 14 companies. And it was working. So we said, great. Why don't we do this in New York? And we did it in New York. And we interviewed students. And we picked students in New York. Um, and then we did it in San Francisco. And then we did it in Boston. So today, the dorm room fund has um, four funds of 500,000 each running in these cities, all run by students, all investing in students. And they've made almost 50 investments cumulatively. And why do I bring this up? The reason why I bring it up is because at Penn, of the, of the 10 students that are on the dorm room fund, half are women. Um, and what we think that will do is that gives them experience. That gives, you know, and, and when we talk to them now, and we talk to both the men and the women, they were saying, yeah, you know, I never thought I wanted to be a venture capitalist before. I never thought I wanted to be an entrepreneur before. And this gave me real credible experience that now this has changed sort of what I want to do with my life. And in fact, one of the graduates who, um, of someone who graduated Penn this year, uh, she was a member of the Dorm Room Fund Investment Committee. She's gotten a job as an analyst at Bessemer. A larger venture firm, and so you know, and and so what we're hoping is through programs like the dorm room fund and programs like this, you know, you're able to sort of build that 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 platform that could give people the experience and the opportunity. So um, at least that's that's our bet. Um, and we'll see how it plays. Ask me in ten years how it worked. I could tell you, but that's kind of how we're playing it. Yes, back there. Uh, now that PayPal is an established player, do you think it's too big or too slow? And will something like that be like? So the question was, now that PayPal is a larger company, is it too big or too slow? I mean, too big and too slow is relative. It's 
too big than what or too slow than that. But like, yes, as companies get large, um, their ability to innovate shrinks, their ability to, to, to experiment is reduced, and, and, and their, you know, your, your, the ability to sort of mobilize on an opportunity is tough. So like, we've seen plenty of companies that are really large that have seen, right, like Facebook is even large, and Facebook saw Instagram come out, and Facebook had, you know, Instagram had eight employees, and Facebook had thousands, and there was no reason why Facebook couldn't have built that. But maybe they're not fast enough. Maybe they're not, they're, you know, they're not able to be that adaptive. And even Facebook, which I'd say is a scrappy company, has those challenges. So like, that's one of the barriers, that's one of the real hard parts of large companies, is building that culture and building that flexibility that enables that to happen, right? Like, everyone looks at Microsoft right now and, and is just amazed at, you know, you're talking about like tens of thousands of engineers. Um, like, what are they building? And, and, and you, you know, but the same thing's happening at Google now. And, and the same thing will happen at Facebook as companies get larger, their ability to innovate shrinks. Um, one thing I just realized, going back to the dorm room fund, um, I want to at least make sure everyone here knows that um, starting this fall, uh, we're going to add one member of the Yale community to the New York-based dorm room fund team, and we're going to start investing in Yale as well. The dorm room fund will start investing in Yale as well. So if you're at all interested, stay tuned. Go check out, you know, follow Dorm Room Fund on Twitter. Check, sign up on their website because either a to a to be interested as an uh, to be a considered to, for that investment committee slot or for your company to be considered by there. Um, we think it, we we think there are some neat startups here, and we'd love to make sure that the Dorm Room Fund has the opportunity to review them. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I have a question, but first, just some trivia. Um, Venmo is owned by Braintree, which is owned by eBay, which owns PayPal. So it's all but it was. Like, that, that was in the last year. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, <laughs> do you have a theory or a uh, hypothesis on the Internet of Things and uh, any thoughts around that? Yeah, so I mean, we've invested in it. We've funded um, a few companies. We funded a company called Smart Things. Um, we were the seed investors there, which has basically built, hub and built the hub. We funded some of the edge devices. We funded a company called Mayo, which has sort of you know, a wearable product. Um, you know, our view is that the bulk of it is going to be one in the software space, that, um, that there's going to be very few unique new hardware devices that people wear. Um, most of the intelligence is going to be in your phone. Um, so the bet that we made with smart things was, for example, that, you know, the, the power is going to be in the cloud and the hub rather than trying to bet on any one specific form factor that will win. And I think a lot of the winners today so far are winning, which is great. And the, one of the reasons they're winning is because, to answer my, as I go back to the last question, the larger companies are slower and more patient and waiting. But like when you see them move, um, you, know, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll see them move quickly. We funded a company called Doorbot, which basically is uh, a, an internet connected doorbell. So if someone rang my doorbell at home right now, my phone would ring. And I'd see a video of who was at my front door. And then I could press a button and talk to them and say, leave the package there. And if it was my kid who was coming home from school who was saying, hi, dad, I could push a button and open up my, you know, my, my electronic lock and let, let him in. Right? Like, so those are the types of things we're funding. Um, so are we funding some devices? Yes. But if you ask me sort of specifically, um, both in the Internet of Things and in the wearable space, a lot of the, the ultimate value is going to go to, uh, to the software play rather than the hardware play. In the back. Um, if you become finance in the funding process, um, do you ask for some percentage of equity? How much is it? Or, or do you just look for returns for the investment in the future? So the, the question was, when we're, when we're considering a company, how do we figure out what we're getting? Do we get a certain percentage of equity? So, you know, or, or do we get dead, or do we just try to figure out returns? Um, I'll speak in generalities. I'd say typically at the seed stage, we are taking equity in companies. Sometimes we take a convertible debt, uh, which is just debt that converts into equity at a later date. Um, we typically will take convertible debt if a large round is imminent in three or four months, and instead, it's my doorbell. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> three or four months, and, and, and you know, we don't need to price around now if another round is going to happen in three or four months. Um, you know, I'd say that the, you know, 
the value of a company is based on the market size and the, how, how far they've de-risked it. But at a seed stage, a large part of it is based on the founders because we're backing founders. 70% of our investment decision is based on the founders and 30% is based on product and, and, and market. And to some degree, the way we look at product is, is the way that we review founders because right, like you're trying to understand, what we try to understand is how do founders make decisions? Um, and what's the single best way to look at that, we think? is let's look at their product. Because a product is a synthesis of hundreds of decisions that were made over, made over weeks or months, right? So the product that you're going to show me is, is nothing more than hundreds or thousands of decisions that you have made. Um, well, that's a great way for us to understand how you make decisions. So we're, not, so we're not looking at the product for the product's sake. We're looking at the product as a lens to understand the founders. So why do I bring this up? Because I think it really varies, right? Like when, when, when Jack, who founded Twitter, was going on, um, you know, to found Square, his valuation was significantly higher than any other startups that we had ever funded to that point. Uh, why? Because we were backing that founder. Um, but in general, we're, we're typically, um, you know, we as an investor are looking to get somewhere between 5 to 10% of ownership of a company that we invest in at seed stage. That's different than, a, like I'd say, a traditional Series A investor. A traditional Series A investor is looking to get 20% of a company for leading that Series A round. Um, rules of thumb, there are always exceptions, but, but that's kind of there. And, and, and the other thing I'd say is, you know, my advice is that venture is probably oftentimes the worst opportunity for you to raise money for your companies. Because uh, what, what do venture capitalists look for? Right? Venture capitalists look for completely outlier exits, right? Venture cap, and the reason why it's important, it's probably important to understand the math regarding venture funds. Is there a piece of chalk or something I could use to write on the board? Yeah, right there. Okay. So if you look at a typical Silicon Valley venture fund, call it a $400 million fund. To stay in business, what do they need to do? They need to return about 3x to their investors. So you think you'd multiply that times three, and you got to return 1.2 billion. But the venture capitalist is greedy and is going to make carry. So that venture cap and, and, and take fees. So that, you know, in order to return 3x, you really have to sort of, after their fees, you're going to have to sort of add in and make it about 1.5 billion because the venture capitalist you know, is going to take money. So in order for the investor to get 3x, it has to be about 1.5 billion. You with me so far? That's how, much the, that's how much they need to return to their investors. Now, a venture capitalist owns, maybe they'll be lucky to own 20% of a company going in. And it's rare that they hold on to that full 20% because it gets diluted by acquisitions and option pool. But say they own 20%. If they own 20% of a company, in order to get $1.5 billion of value to their investors, right, divided by 20%, means they have to create $7.5 billion of market value. Does that make sense? So that means you have to create $7.5 billion worth of market value in order to hit your number. So let's put that in perspective. The average venture portfolio size is 60 companies. Half fail. So if half of those companies fail, someone with a calculator could divide 7.5 billion times divided by 30. Um, and my sense is they'd come up with about $250 million um, for, every, for every company that didn't fail. Like, that's incredible. Like, when you think about it, right? Like, we were the seed investor in a company called Mint. Intuit bought them for $175 million. Like, that's a great outcome. If you're an investor and from a large $400 million fund, you'd be like, oh, shit. Um, like, I'd have returned 250 on that one. Um, and, and so the reason I bring this up is because this is what drives, this is the math that drives venture capital. Now, in reality, they're not going to have all 30 companies that didn't fail exit for 250. What they're doing is they're hoping that they have a LinkedIn or a Twitter or a Facebook or an Uber or an Airbnb or a Dropbox or one of those big companies in their fund. So, but, but why is it important to understand this? It's really important to understand this because this is what drives them. If you build a business and you raise $3 million of venture capital and you still own 80% of the company, an investor has put in $3 million and they own 20% of the company. And six months later, you get an offer to sell that company for $100 million, which would be $80 million for you, life-changing. 
like massively life-changing, and that investor makes $20 million, that's a complete failure for that investor, even though they took their $3 million and turned it into 20. Does that make, like, and it's really important to understand this because when you get a term sheet, it has all of these terms on it but from a venture capitalist, but the unwritten term on the term sheet is what are they expecting you to do? What type of return profile are they, 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 that is their expectation? And the reason I bring this up is because um, oftentimes when you take venture money, it forces you onto a trajectory. And it forces you onto that trajectory based on their math and what's meaningful to them, not what's meaningful to you. Um, so, you know, it, I don't, it, it's when, you, when you're talking to investors, it's, it's like I don't think anyone has ever asked what's, what, what fund size are you investing out of? But that's a damn important question for people to be asking because it helps you understand what their expectations are regarding return. How do they make money? Um, when, when you look at, at what it takes to move their needle, it's really important because then you're able to sort of say, oh, because what I'd hate to find is that you took capital and didn't understand the bargain you were entering into. If a VC had a 10% ch chance of creating a billion dollar company and a 90% chance of failure, or an 80% chance of creating $150 million and a 20% chance of failure, they would take the 10% billion dollar chance all, all the time. Why? Because they have 60 companies in their portfolio and they're playing portfolio risk. They're saying of the 60, six will be billion dollar companies. Boom, I hit my seven and a half billion dollar number. Um, so, you know, and I realize I run a small fund, so I, I, I could be accused of selling my own book here, and I, and I acknowledge that, so I just want to be transparent. But it's really important when you're thinking through how to capitalize your business, what are the expectations of the partner? Um, and, and it's very rare that this is laid out for the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur understands what they're playing for. So we pass on companies all the time. This year we will pass on 2,970 companies roughly. Um, and the, one of the top three reasons that we pass on the company is that, you know, top, if you look at all the past reasons, there's some that we pass on the team and some that we pass on the market or the product. Um, but it's very often, almost every day, we're passing on companies where we think the founder will create money. And we think that company will be worth something. We just don't think that the, the founder's math or the size of the opportunity or the outcome works for our model. Even with us, when we have a much smaller fund than a $400 million fund. You know, I'll give you an analogy. When I, when I take the train up here, um, I start off in Philadelphia and I'm going to New York, say. Um, I have an option. I can get on the express train, the Acela, or the local. They both go to the same destination. If you, you know, and I'd say raising money, you know, the difference is the local stops. You know, and raising money from investors, when you raise money from a large bulge bracket investor, you know, you're kind of buying the express, you're buying an express ticket to a billion dollar outcome because that's typically what they're playing for, right? They don't want you to get off at a hundred million dollar exit. They don't want you to get off at a fifty million dollar exit. They lose money there, so you're buying that express ticket. When you raise money from angels or from small funds, or from funds where you, where you understand their exit math might not be this exit math, you're buying a ticket on the local. You know, the doors will open in Trenton, the doors will open in Newark, the doors will open at Metro Park. And you could basically say, like, oh, there's smoke on the train, we should get out for $50 million here. Um, like, you know, or no, let's keep going. And you, you, you sit on the train, you keep going, then the doors open at the next stop. Oh, wow. Like, maybe we could exit now for $200 million. Now nah, let's stay on. Great. But you have the option. And I think it's really important to understand what options you're giving up when you raise money from venture. Um, from, because I've seen plenty of great companies with plenty of great opportunities to create wealth for founders destroyed because of mismatch between founders' expectations and investor expectations. Yes? Sure. So I was going to say, so what do you recommend in that, in that scenario then? If your company is, um, you know, high growth potential, um, potentially very profitable, uh, maybe doesn't fit the sort of rocket ship um, uh, kind of profile, what's, you know, what's, what are some alternatives that uh, we should be looking at or that our founders should be looking at? I would argue angel capital. I'd argue small funds. Um, 
You know, so there are funds. There, you know, in the fact, in the last, in the, if you, if you, there, it was just a Google Doc. I saw that listed micro venture funds, micro, micro, micro VCs, that were created in the last five years that managed less than hundred million dollars, and there were over two hundred funds on that list. Um, so it's a whole new category. AngelList is a whole new tool that exists that did, never existed before, um, which I think is fundamentally disrupting and transforming the venture land, landscape. Um, you know, and, and, and by the way, there are plenty of people that want to start off with some of this, and then they say, wow, I really think we figured out the rocket ship. And then they go and get the large money. You know, then they go out and raise the large rounds from the large funds. And look, I'm, I'm not saying that under every scenario you raise money from a large VC, they'll be, they'll be upset when you exit for $175 million. Although, you know, like, like Mint had raised money from Benchmark, which is a large VC. Um, but, you know, but Aaron was still able to exit. All I'm saying is that, um, you know, again, speaking in generalities, it's important to understand your, the, par your par the partner across the table, your investor's math, just as well as it is to understand your own. Expectations, risk, their ability or desire to stay on the train to the last stop, etc. <laughs> so, I'd say one of the reasons that second-time founders get a premium in valuation is because if they've been successful before, you know they might stay on the train longer. They might their risk profile might be more aligned to the VCs, right? Someone had a great exit and sold the company and made twenty million dollars before. Well, the difference between zero in their bank account and twenty million is massive. Right? And so they're going to take that. Now they have 20 million. What are they playing for? They're not playing for another 20. The difference between 20 million and 40 million is kind of inconsequential. They're playing for 250, right? Like they're playing for that huge win. So that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is that um, you know, when we're looking at founders, how do we assess them? It's, it, we found that we have very hard, we have bad crystal balls in trying to predict what price the founders will exit at. And it's a fruitless exercise. Um, you know, because we've had second time founders who, surprise us and punch out early. And we've had you know, first time founders that have surprised us by going the distance. Um, you know, so we're, we're, really, we're not trying to predict exit value or, or likelihood. What we are trying to figure out is how unique and exceptional that founder is. Like, here's my belief. If you're starting a company at age 35 or 22, it's not like at age 35 you're going to be an average person. And like, I believe that exceptional companies are started by exceptional founders. So I believe if you're starting a company at age 35, it's not like you're going to be average and ordinary until 35. And now you're going to be CEO, so you're going to be extraordinary. Most founders who are going to be extraordinary founders have had a background of being standout and extraordinary, of blowing people away and surprising and just doing that. And the same thing at age 21, right? Like we meet founders at age 22 who have like written a book, have you know, started a charity, have just done something extraordinary before. And, 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 and that's kind of a large part of what we're looking for. Um, you know, is, you know, is that our belief is that extraordinary companies are built by extraordinary people. So we look for a track record of being out of the ordinary. We look for a track record of sort of being disruptive and creating things. And I can tell you, we have our CEO summit every year. I can't tell you, you know, we ask one question every year. What percent of you um, bought candy at like Costco and sold at bulk and sold it on the bus? Um, and it's massive, right? Like it's like a very high percentage. Like it's not like you weren't entrepreneurial for their first 18 years or for the first 25 years, and then all of a sudden someone flicked a switch. You know, we it, we find that there's a lot of correlation, at least the, to the com entrepreneurs we'd like to. Well, there's correlation to one thing in our com in our community. It's who we back. So the entrepreneurs that we like to back are the entrepreneurs that have had some inclination um, towards either entrepreneurship or doing something that stands out. Um, in their so, career. Thank you, Josh. Informal survey. How many people here have sold candy on the bus? <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you afterwards. Let's give Josh an applause.